<laughs> it looked then like she was shaming me, so I'll just be shamed in advance for talking about nerd things. This is actually a really interesting topic to me. Strangely, lately has caught my my eye. Um, people have presumably heard of this SSL stuff, right? Uh, this is a way of securing things on the internet. It's also known as uh, transport layer security (TLS). Uh, the TLS part came in when uh, Microsoft and uh, all of the other browser makers sat down with SSL 3.0. Uh, and Netscape had invented the name SSL, and Microsoft was like, yeah, we're not taking your name. That is not going to happen. So now it's TLS. Uh, so from SSL 3.1 forward, it is now known as TLS. Same thing. Uh, but it's basically how you uh, create a secure interaction with a website when you go there so that you're not transmitting data in the clear. Uh, has anybody ever used Wireshark, fired up a packet inspector, yeah. looked at these? They're just, you know, a packet is just, think of a text file flying over the wire, right? And if your password is just sitting out there, that is a bad thing, right? Because anyone with Wireshark on your Wi-Fi network can listen to that sort of thing. So uh, SSL starts uh, approximately with SSL certificates. I'm going to review those real quick. Uh, they are a, a way of generating a public and private key in a very uh, specific and safe way. So. Uh, a public and private key pair uh, are basically think two numbers that have this unique property that if I encrypt a thing with my public key, uh, you can decrypt it with your private key and no one else can in the whole world, right? But you can share your public key publicly and anyone can encrypt things and they go only to you because you're the only person who can decrypt those things, okay? So uh, this uh, originally came from these uh, three gentlemen. RSA stands for Rivest Shamir Edelman. Maybe I'm saying that incorrectly. Uh, Feel free to well actually me also later, I will say. This is a short talk. I'm trying hard to go quickly. Uh, but this is what a certificate looks like on the inside. They're uh, kind of obfuscated unintentionally. They're not that scary, really. Like, this is what they look like instead. See how not scary that is? Um, I'm just kidding. Actually, at the top here is just some general information. You can see this one was made by a company called Scheffler Holdings, LLC. Uh, the Mergers and Acquisitions Department, Sir Joan and Scheffler Esquire III, created this <laughs> certificate. Uh, and then you have a modulus, this 2048-bit uh, thing, uh, and you have an exponent. And these are just uh, a couple of known numbers that we pass around. This is not encrypted. The part that I just did was just decoding the, the standard certificate format. So uh, you can get these out of any certificate. You can go and look what the modulus was and the exponent was, and later you can do some math with it. Um, the important thing comes when we get to the secret part. But I want to notice that, that on the top we have this... Uh, bit of the certificate, and on the bottom we have, uh, the top we have the public key, I'm sorry, uh, and on the bottom we have the signature algorithm. So there are two parts in here. The signature algorithm is the way that you know that you're actually talking to me, right? So if you send a message to Jonan's website, and Joe, evil, sinister Joe, standing in the middle, <laughs> um, grabs those packets and sucks them up and says, yeah, I'm totally Jonan, right? And at the same time initiates a connection to Jonan's website, right? This is called a man in the middle attack. And what Joe can do is establish a secure connection with you handing off his Jonan certificate, that is a fake Jonan certificate, and then he can establish a secure connection to me. And all the way it looks secure and all of the traffic is encrypted, except you're not talking to who you think you are, right? So we have to solve that problem. And the way we do that is by signing certificates. So this certificate is signed by a signing authority. This is why you have to pay so much for these certificates. Is it someone's job, some company's job, to sign certificates so that when Jonan goes and says, this is my key, may I have a certificate, please? Uh, fancy, expensive, VeriSign company, their certificates are extra good because they cost more, um, <laughs> will sign the bottom of that thing and say, yes, you are indeed Jonan. And probably there's like something where they send me an email or they check that I actually own Scheffler Holdings LLC. Companies do it different ways, but they basically verify the identity of me. This is me. You can trust that this is me, right? And all of the browsers come with uh, a set of uh, public keys provided by those companies. So if your, th your certificate is signed by VeriSign, uh, then the browser, Chrome, knows how to check if that signature is valid. So you're able to ask your browser, and your browser says, yes, this is legit, VeriSign signed this. I can tell because I have VeriSign's public key, and this particular signature could only have been created with that public key. And that's something we're able to determine, OK? So your browser is going to check. Uh, when you get a certificate from someone, you as the client get a certificate from the server, we're going to check that signature, first of all, to verify that we're talking to who we think we are, right? So this is how the SSL handshake works. This is the negotiation that happens between a client and server when you start collecting. First, the client says hello, right? The first packet to go out to a server, right? We finished our DNS lookup, and we're talking to jonans.com. Uh, it's a boring one. We'll call it like cutepuppies.com, right? We're going to cutepuppies.com, and cutepuppies.com uh, gets a client hello from us. And we tell it our SSL version, um, cipher suites that we have available. These are the 
secret code algorithms that we will use to crunch numbers and encrypt things, right? These are the things that I support, basically. I say, hello there, this is my SSL version. These are the ciphers that I support. And here is a random bit of data, OK? The server, in turn, says, hello. I see you, right? I'm looking right at you. I open this connection here, and I give you back the chosen cipher. From your list of ciphers, I've compared it to the list of ciphers that I support, and I give you back this one. We're going to use this cipher, OK? So it chooses that one for you. It returns a session ID uh, that you can use to resume the session if you like in the future. That original client hello could have included a session ID, of course, if you were trying to resume a session. But this is an ID to uniquely identify this interchange here, this, co this conversation we're having. So they can come back later. And a random byte again, different random byte. So I've got your random byte, you've got my random byte, right? Two random uh, bits of numbers, so, uh, or bytes, rather. Uh, and then the certificate. I give you my certificate, and I say, I am cutepuppies.com, right? And you check the signature, your browser checks the signature, and it's like, yep, you are indeed cutepuppies.com. It is registered to Scheffler Holdings. This Sir Jonan guy thinks quite a lot of himself. Um, and then we proceed, right? And the client verifies the certificate, uh, checks that the cipher is acceptable. We double check again. Did you actually give me a thing that was in my list of ciphers that I can handle? Uh, and the client does this uh, key exchange, right? So the client is going to generate a pre-master key using those two random numbers that we exchanged. We're going to generate what's called a pre-master key. And I'm going to encrypt it with the public key from the certificate. Now remember, the only one person in the world, right, cutepuppies.com, is able to read this. And we know that because they have the private key, right? Keep it secret. Keep it safe. They've got it locked up in their incredibly secure server. All servers are pretty dialed in tight. Um, <laughs> so this pre-master key uh, is encrypted with the public key from that certificate, and I send it off to the server. And we use that to generate a master key. So the client says, all right, the master key can be generated independently at this point. The pre-master is what you use to generate the master. The client uses the pre-master to generate the master key. And then it uses the master key, which is the actual big number that we're going to use to encrypt all of our traffic from now on off that pre-master. And it immediately encrypts a message and sends a client fi finished thing. And the reason this is important is now the server can very easily tell if they've done things correctly. right? If maybe they got one of the numbers wrong that we traded back and forth, there's been a lot of number trading, it gets to the end. And if it's able to decrypt this client finished message, the server knows that everything is A-OK. -okay, right? So the server says, uh, I'm done. And it encrypts it with the, the master secret key. Uh, and we're done. That was the SSL handshake. OK? Uh, has anyone heard of this thing? Seen this logo? Very well marketed, this SSL stuff, right? Probably. So just to give you the gist of how this works, uh, there is a thing built into OpenSSL that allows you to take a heartbeat off a server. And you can specify the size of the data you want back, even though like, that much data wouldn't necessarily be returned. So suffice it to say, like, I can be like, hey, you, give me 64 kilobytes of data. And it will give me 64 kilobytes, even if it only really had 1K of things to say. Right? So guess what the other 63 is? Well, you, I mean, you would assume, of course, just random bits of memory. right? That's what I would do if I were building this thing. So <laughs> we'll just take some random chunk of my memory and ship it off to you. And we'll do it over and over again, because you can do a lot of heartbeats. right? And eventually, you have all of the memory of the computer. You can basically just dump the memory off of servers with Heartbleed. <laughs> Turns out that's a bad thing, right? because <laughs> there's this really important thing that we kept secret and safe in the server. That was the SSL certificate. Mark Twain famously said, put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket. This is basically how the internet works. <laughs> so we have this security theory uh, that we have this public and this private key. And we go to great lengths to make sure that only one person can have that private key. And then we require them to keep it on their server, which is like about the least secure place they can keep it. But they have to, because they've got to be able to decrypt all this traffic as things are coming in, right? This is a necessity. There's no way around this, right? Except um, there kind of is. It's called perfect forward security. Uh, it, the idea behind perfect forward security is that even uh, in our session that we negotiate, right, we come up with an SSL session. Let's say in the imaginary world where we've been having a year's worth of SSL traffic, and I work at Google, I go and my, my uh, certificate is expired. Right? And I'm like, oh, I don't need that anymore. And I throw that hard drive in the garbage, and I put a new certificate in here. Uh, I got a new server, and that garbage ends up in the NSA's hands. Right? They have that certificate. Maybe they came to me, and they forced me to give it to them with a gag order. Right? You don't need that old certificate. Just give it. Right? But also, maybe the, the servers over there at the NSA have a chunk of traffic from the last year that maybe they care about, or maybe just all of the traffic, because they have rather a lot of hard drives. Right? So 
If that is the case, and they compromise this private key, they're able to decrypt all of that traffic back in time. Right? None of those conversations that were had are secret anymore because the random bits that were passed back and forth were all passed in the clear. And then when they weren't, they were encrypted with a public key that I can decrypt with the private key. Right? So this information allows me to go and decrypt all of the traffic retroactively that I may have been saving up waiting to get my hands on that certificate. All right? Perfect forward security eliminates that possibility. And it does it by making sure that the shared secret that we come up with, what was our master secret, that big number that we used to put into some math and come up with some fancy encryption, that number is different for every session. Right? If I talk to Joe and then Dan later gets my certificate, he can read only this session right here. Right? He gets this one number from this session. If he compromises that secret, he only gets to read what I'm saying to Joe. And everything else that has happened in the past is gone. And the way that that can be accomplished is with a fancy trick called Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Has anybody ever heard of Diffie-Hellman key exchange? Right? Anybody ever thought they would want to hear about it again? <laughs> you get to, because you're here. So Diffie-Hellman key exchange has a lot of uh, creative implementations that go beyond this, but I'm going to give kind of a simple explanation of how this works, OK? Um, with our enemy Joe the Mantis Shrimp in the middle and the two clownfish on the sides, OK? Um, so I am, I am a clownfish here with uh, my friend Kirsten, and I'm trying to have a secret conversation, and, and Joe's listening in, right? So we, we agree on a shared color. Our shared color is going to be blue. That's just what we choose. It's arbitrary, right? And now Joe's got blue. Joe is also listening on this clear wire, right, where we've both exchanged blue. We're all good, right? Everybody knows blue because it was passed in public. Now, we each have a secret color. My secret color is yellow, right? Her secret color is red. So we're going to use those secret colors to come up with a shared secret that Joe could not possibly divine. And for the purposes of this analogy, I want you to assume that undoing a color mixing is a very difficult thing. Okay? In the math, it's a the discrete logarithm problem. And it turns out that is a very difficult thing. A lot of people way smarter than me have proven this is a very difficult thing to undo. Okay? So we have these secret colors, and we mix them with our shared color. And as everyone knows, yellow and blue make mauve. In Photoshop, <laughs> if you don't properly set your colors to CMYK or understand additive color properties. So, um, <laughs> yellow and blue make mauve for me. Uh, and Kirsten gets pretty close, actually, despite all of that, with the red and blue making a purple color. Okay? Now we're going to pass these back and forth. I'm going to say, hey, mauve. And she's going to say purple. And now Joe's got those two. All right? So Joe has the three colors that we've passed in clear over the wire. I receive the purple, and I put it over here with my colors, and she's got the mauve. Now, an interesting thing can happen here in that Joe has those three colors, right? The, the ones that are matter, I've removed the shared color from this slide. The ones that matter here are the purple and the mauve. Now, interestingly, I can mix my yellow with her purple and get the union of yellow, blue, and red, right? Because she's just passed me those two colors mixed together. And nowhere in that mix was Joe able to get access to yellow, right? So we come up with this secret color that Joe cannot possibly divide because he doesn't have access to red or yellow. He doesn't know what those colors are. He doesn't know how these colors are made. We have this secret color that we do not transmit over the wire because we've just created a shared secret. And it allows us to have a discussion in private one time. This is a unique shared secret that we can generate again and again, right? So everybody's like getting Diffie-Hellman key exchange, right? It's super easy because now we're going to do it uh, here in math, which is actually pretty easy too, as it turns out. Math is not that scary. But as you can see, Nixie is, is equal to Nix here. So uh, exponents have this, this silly thing where if you raise to a power and then you raise to a different power, you can swap their places later and it's the same, right? Same as So uh, I'll prove it to you here that 2 squared to the fifth and 2 to the fifth squared come up with the same number, all right? So uh, there is a uh, special type of math called modular arithmetic. And everyone's familiar with the modulus function, maybe, maybe not. A uh, little percentage symbol thing, and you put some numbers on one side and some numbers on the other side, and crazy happens, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it's basically the remainder function, OK? I'm going to put a thing on the left that's called the generator and a thing on the right that's called the modulus. And then the number of times that the generator goes into the modulus, uh, and then I, I have the, the remainder at the end. That is the result of this operator, OK? So we're all familiar with modulus, and we're good. Um, there are special types of doing this, uh, special numbers that we can choose for doing this in Diffie-Hellman key exchange that make it very difficult to undo. And what we do is we choose a very large prime number for the left half, and we choose a primitive root of that number for the other half. Okay? And primitive roots uh, are not actually that difficult to explain, so I'm going to go through them real quick here. A primitive root um, for 
this uh, generator here, we have a 3 and a 17. I've chosen small numbers. In reality, these are very large, right? Uh, but we put 3 into 17, and we get some remainder. And we put 3 squared into 17, and we get some remainder. And we put 3 th to the third. And as we inch upward in that exponent, we never get a result that is outside of the subset of numbers 1 to 16, OK? So for this 1 to 17, or I'm sorry, we, we will eventually uh, duplicate these numbers, right? We'll repeat in this set. But as I raise that exponent from 1 to 17, I will get the array of numbers 1 to 16. Okay? And that's all it means, basically, to be a primitive root of a large prime number. Uh, they have a special sort of relationship that makes this math very difficult to undo. Okay? So what we have here is an opportunity to add some secret information. Um, that's the next slide is German for the end. But I want to explain here real quickly um, that the, the exponent here is the secret information that we can choose differently. Right? If I choose a number to raise my exponent to, say 3, and she chooses a number, say 5, and then we do the math and get the result and exchange our results, and then we raise to the power again, then we have a shared secret that we've negotiated that cannot be undone. It's passed over a public wire. And that's how Diffie-Hellman key exchange works. So Diffie-Hellman key exchange allows us to achieve perfect forward secrecy. It is a thing that has been around for 30 or 35 or 40 years, long before my time. This is an old thing, right? We don't use it because it increases the overhead of the internet. By maybe 15%, some people say. I haven't done the benchmarks myself. They are not my numbers. But uh, I consider it to be an incredibly unethical thing that we are un unwilling to slow down our web pages by 15% in order to actually just not let the NSA ever steal anything ever again. So uh, maybe if you get a chance sometime and you're installing OpenSSL, consider using one of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange algorithms. Uh, elliptical and uh, ephemeral are the two things you're looking for. So elliptical Diffie-Hellman key exchange ephemeral is the particular one that uh, is significantly faster than what we just described. This is a little bit computationally intensive for large numbers. Uh, but this uses some kind of uh, prediction to get to those numbers faster. Uh, and it also does it in a way that that token is generated securely for each single session and never exists again or is useful to anyone ever again. So that's all I've got to say about SSL. Thank you.